it's now my privilege to, um, in, to introduce Tim Marimer. Tim is a founding staff member of the Centre for Rural Strategies and edits the organisation's news platform, The Daily Yonder, www.dailyyonder.com. Tim manages a nationwide network of correspondents, both paid and volunteer, and who report on rural people, places and issues. During the pandemic, Tim has led a team that produces weekly comprehensive reports on the status of COVID-19 in rural America. Tim grew up in Eastern Kentucky and started his journalism career on a weekly newspaper while a student at Berea, brackets Kentucky, college. So he served as an editor of the Daily Chapel Hill, North Carolina Herald and as zoned edition editors of the Durham, the Durham Herald Sun. He's an advisor to the Institute of Nonprofit News Rural Initiative and 100 Days in Appalachia. Tim holds a master's degree in journalism from the University of North Carolina. He is married, has two adult children, and lives in Norris, Tennessee, a town of 1600 located in the Tennessee Valley between the Great Smoky Mountains and the Cumberland Plateau. Welcome, Tim. Thank you so much, Shona. Um, it's just such a pleasure to be here. I, I can hardly express uh, how exciting it is to be part of your gathering and um, uh, to be able to offer a little bit of perspective from uh, where I sit. Uh, my town is in Norris and this is uh, traditional land of uh, the Cherokee Nation. Um, the, the Daily Yonder is a publication of uh, the NGO, the, the Center for Rural Strategies. This organization started as a kind of a general purpose communications group to look at rural issues uh, and policy in 2001. We had a lot of, uh, we helped a lot of journalists cover rural issues. We did some polling. Um, we helped release some stories nationally. And along the way, our journalist friends said, uh, you know, you guys should be publishing yourselves and, and both covering the rural news and helping show how it might be covered and how rural news is is really national news in the United States. So we started publishing the Daily Yonder in 2007. Our first editor was uh, uh, Julie Artery and Bill Bishop, who's the author of a book called The Big Sort. Uh, he lives in LaGrange, Texas, and uh, formerly lived in Austin there where the Tribune is. So he was at the Statesman at the time. So our goals with uh, behind the Daily Yonder were exclusively online. Um, we're trying to fill missing information um, for a broad public, including rural people, but also people who are interested in rural or we think ought to be interested in rural issues. And I would say, based on what I know a little bit, you know, our idea of rural would kind of equate with regional uh, in, in Australia a bit, um, that it's outside of the... Um, you know, the urban centers, uh, if you will, on the coastal parts of uh, the United States. Um, and we want to redefine uh, rural in a way that better reflects the realities of, of our diverse communities and what it's like to live and work in rural areas. We wanted a chance to respond directly to uh, image makers who, who write and cover rural areas to not be, uh, to provide uh, feedback on how that on media criticism, I guess you would call that. And to also show the interrelationship of rural America with the rest of the nation and how uh, we're culturally and economically uh, bound to each other. Some of the problems uh, in the United States with with rural areas, which we generally define um, as uh, counties that have a city under 50,000 residents or that are not within the market area of a city of 50,000. That's a rough and ready way, but it's a, it's a loose uh, definition. Um, but from a journalism standpoint, there's a lot on the coasts, uh, New York, Washington, Los Angeles, and there's a there's a lot of what would be considered to be flyover country in the United States, and we wanted to uh, 
fill in, uh, color in the, the, that picture so it wasn't just fly over. There's also a sense uh, from some studies that we've done that people look at rural places kind of one of two ways, both of which are not helpful from a public policy standpoint. One is that it's utopia. The people there, we eat our own homegrown tomatoes and we help each other put, build barns and uh, wear calico and, uh, you know, uh, uh, generally have it better, you know, and uh, if we're poor, we're noble you know, and that counts for a lot. The other, and the only thing you can do with a, <clears throat> from a public policy standpoint with some, with an image like that is screw it up. Um, oh, don't do that. Uh, you're just gonna screw it up because it's perfect. On the other end of the picture is a, a dystopia where, you know, it's, it's hookworm and bad teeth and incest and just, you know, tar paper shacks and horrible uh, tropes and stereotypes about rural. And of course, there's nothing you can do. It's a lost cause. So from a public policy standpoint, both are problematic. Um, and and uh, a large, so rural, the rural America I'm talking about is uh, 15 to 20% of the US population, depending on how you define it. And was and as Evan was saying, that's a it, it's a small number, but it's politically uh, very important in our uh, electoral college system and how we elect uh, the president and how the Senate also is uh, two representatives per state, not based on a per capita basis. So it has a lot of political clout. Um, it, it also, there's a perception that it's uh, uh, white only. And in fact, uh, the last census shows that uh, there's more diversity in rural America. It's gone up to about 20% uh, non-white. Um, and so we want to address that uh, kind of trope that it's, the, uh, it's only a, a, a white population in rural areas. Um, and, but it is tremendously diverse. You've got everything from kind of small villages up in New England, kind of your classic uh, white steepled church and uh, Main Street out to very, uh, you know, frontier-like areas that would be much like uh, the Australian outback in, in my mind, very low densities in population and, and lack of services. There's a perception that rural America is all farming, and in fact, only about 2% of rural residents earn their primary living from farming, so there's a lot more going on there. In fact, uh, more people, there's a greater percentage of rural residents who work in manufacturing than uh, in urban areas, as a matter of fact, which is kind of goes against the grain. Our jobs are primarily in uh, service sector, just like everywhere else, government services. Um, so there, um, we, we want to represent uh, a viewpoint from rural communities um, that's an authentic um, place-based look at issues on one hand and to give people the chance to cover and write about um, their way of life, how it's unique, um, how it is different from urban areas. Um, we also want to uh, cover national issues in a way that help link rural communities and for them to see the common, uh, primarily the common kind of policy uh, ceilings they're up against. Um, my experience in rural places is that uh, folks think, you know, if I just worked a little bit harder, you know, if I coached the little league and taught Sunday school and drove the school bus, uh, you know, we would work ourselves out of the situation we're in where it's an economically difficult spot. And the reality is that there are factors beyond rural communities, uh, individual control that we have to address as a nation. And our idea is that um, we need a place where those ideas can come forward. And that's one role we try to play. Um, and uh, just very quickly that, um, we also try to assist um, truly regional publications. There's a vast infrastructure of weekly newspapers in, um, in rural America. Um, they're in some ways, I think with the 
previous recession around 2008, they fared a little bit better than dailies did, um, perhaps because they had a kind of a more of a monopoly on information, um, a devoted readership, and people couldn't get the information anywhere else, and online services hadn't really hit yet. But my sense is that that um, foundation is eroding somewhat now. Um, and so we're trying to help these outlets in ways that we can um, uh, help them cover the news that's important to them. Um, local radio is still very important in rural areas. And um, the infrastructure there includes a lot of Christian broadcasting, a lot of talk radio, a lot of uh, religious news, um, and uh, it is kind of the first place where I think we saw this the uh, divergent uh, sets of information that people were basing their lives around, uh, two sets of facts, if you will, and that was one of the things that was so surprising to people uh, about Donald Trump's election is like, I didn't know people were uh, experiencing things that way or that they would do that. And I think part of that was a divergent set of facts um, and opinion uh, based around media infrastructure and uh, different different ways people were getting information. And we're very keen on trying to bridge that gap. It's difficult, but that's one goal as well. So I'll leave it at that and look forward to the conversation.